We often criticise our governments for their inability to get things done, especially when it comes to large infrastructure projects. The US has been in the news for the Federal Infrastructure Plan, which is promising to put more than a trillion dollars towards upgrading and repairing infrastructure all across the country. Already the project is attracting criticisms from people arguing this won't meet the requirements to fix the nation's failing infrastructure. The same is true for smaller projects which seem to inevitably be plagued with delays and massive cost overruns. This is a real shame because infrastructure spending can be one of the best investments a government can make. In the short term it acts as a form of stimulus. Bridges and roads don't build themselves, they need labourers, engineers, city planners and sure maybe even a few environmental consultants. Just like a stimulus check, this puts money directly into people's pockets and alleviates unemployment. However, unlike a stimulus check, the money is actually going to build something which will continue to provide value to that economy long after regular stimulus checks have been forgotten. Projects like the Hoover Dam were built in part as a way to get people back to work during the Great Recession. Now, almost 100 years later, the dam is still providing a reservoir and electricity. Infrastructure spending, in a word, is fantastic. It's also politically palatable as well. Nobody says that paychecks that workers receive on these projects are handouts, and most infrastructure these days also helps to generate clean energy or reduce time spent in cars or whatever. Infrastructure spending is great, which is probably part of the reason why people get so frustrated when projects never seem to go anywhere, or just get caught up in an endless web of red tape and consultants. That frustration often leads us to look to places like China, where infrastructure projects just seem to work. American bridges and roads are falling into disrepair at the same time China is building feats of engineering once unimaginable. China built an entire hospital in 10 days, while it took the city of San Francisco 10 years to approve a new bus route. California has spent 20 years planning a rail network, in the time that China spent 20 years building out the largest one in the world. And if you think I'm just throwing shade at America, then my own home here in Sydney spent over three billion dollars and more than four years to build our trams, which have all the traffic issues of buses, combined with all the flexibility of trains. It's easy to see why people think that whatever it is that China is doing is working. But unfortunately, it's not. China's high-speed rail network was the centrepiece of the nation's infrastructure development the jewel in the crown of China's building spree, and a public demonstration to the world that effectively amounted to, nah nah, we're better than you. The system is undeniably impressive, but it's also threatening to be a problem for the Chinese economy that could make Evergrande look like a sideshow. So, how did China build out such a massive high-speed rail network so fast? Why did it build out such a massive network? And finally, how much did it really cost to put all of this together? This video is brought to you by Public.com, the investing platform that lets you build your portfolio with confidence. The Public app lets you tune into a collection of live audio shows featuring top entrepreneurs, investors and executives on a daily basis. And in case you'd like to do more than just listen, you can participate in live Q&A sessions called Town Halls that will put you in the same room as public company CEOs. Channel your inner market analyst and get the answers that you've been looking for straight from the top. But first, claim between $3 and $300 in free stock by signing up at public.com slash ee and funding your account. Just use your phone's camera app to scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the video description below if you're watching on your phone. China is a very large country with a lot of people in it. It's also a country where car ownership is seen as somewhat of a luxury. For this reason, a robust rail network was essential for providing a cheap and effective way for people to get around the country. Now for a long time this need was mostly ignored, because most Chinese workers would live and die in the city that they were born in. Travelling across the country was very limited, and so the demand for such a rail network wasn't really there. This all changed in the early 2000s. By this time, the country's plan to open up to the world was well and truly in full swing. More and more young workers were moving from their small hometowns to large cities to provide the labour needed to fuel the nation's ever-growing industrial sector. These workers still wanted to be able to get back to their families, but air travel and personal cars were too expensive for most. Before the rollout of high-speed rail, most workers would just settle on taking bus journeys that would often take days or even weeks to cover relatively modest distances. By the time 2008 rolled around, the Chinese government had already started working on some high-speed rail developments, but the global financial crisis pushed these efforts into high gear, if you would pardon the pun. 
China was not immune from the fallout of the GFC. It was even more heavily dependent on trade back then than it is today, and trade intensity during this period fell rapidly. We covered what trade intensity was in our video two weeks ago on Brexit, so if you want a detailed breakdown of what this means, go and watch that video. But to put it simply, a fall in trade intensity means both imports and exports were falling, which for a country as dependent on global trade as China was, and still is, that was bad news. The counter to this financial blow was fiscal stimulus, but China was apprehensive about just giving money out because they weren't sure at this point how long this crisis would last. Instead, they wanted to take people who might have lost their jobs making stuff for export markets and put them to work building high-speed rail. Keynes actually half-joked about this exact process in the 30s. He argued that an effective form of stimulus would be for the government to bury banknotes in the ground, because at least then the stimulus efforts would put people to work digging up the money, which would look good in unemployment metrics. Of course, if you can get something out of this stimulus spending that isn't just a well-toiled field, then that's probably preferable. The high-speed rail development achieved this goal. It put millions of people to work. The Beijing to Shanghai track alone had over 100,000 direct on-site workers. That's to say nothing of other workers in factories making steel and cement, delivering materials to the site and simply providing goods and services to the workers as they slowly built out these tracks. It was in large part because of this high-speed rail development that China avoided going into recession during this time. So brilliant, right? Mission accomplished. China avoided recession and they got a high-speed rail network out of it, which meant that workers could freely move around the country improving living standards and industrial capacity. Well, this is where the problem starts. From its inception, the rail program has been marred by corruption. Now that's kind of par for the course with a lot of government works projects, especially those taking place in China. But this was one of the largest and most public projects ever, so the corruption scandals were also bound to be bigger and bolder too. This was a bit of a problem for the government because it meant that they weren't able to brag about how amazing their new project was without those claims being overshadowed by news of some official taking a bribe or two. These issues were compounded in 2011 by a crash between two high-speed trains which collided on a section of track that was elevated 20 metres above the ground. It was later revealed that the accident was caused by a series of management failures which had overloaded the route. This had serious impacts on the public's confidence in high-speed rail infrastructure that China just invested hundreds of billions of dollars into building. It also resurfaced concerns about corruption and nepotism in the ranks of the now bloated Ministry of Railways. The government's solution to this was to semi-privatise the railways by selling them to a state-owned corporation, China Railway. A year later, the two companies that were responsible for producing the rail cars, CSR and CNR, merged to form the CRRC. These were two massive state-owned corporations which set out on the biggest building boom yet. Because these corporations were technically distinct from the government, they had more control over how much money they could raise. They borrowed almost a trillion dollars to get Chinese railways to where they are today, and they found this money through a combination of state-owned banks, publicly issued bonds, and investments from local governments. Now almost as soon as the final piece of rail was laid on this latest construction push, the problem started. You see, by the time China Rail had started its latest building spree, most of the highly profitable lines between major population hubs had already been established. This meant that the new lines were being laid to city centres that were not going to demand the same volume of trains and therefore not provide the same revenue from ticket sales. These projects were still pushed by the government, however, because they still wanted people to have access to and from these smaller tier cities, even if it wasn't massively profitable. There are a few reasons why they did this. Most of them were political. Sam from Wendover Productions did a great video on this, so if you're really interested in that, go and watch his video. Misguided political motivations aside, there were other problems too. China's high-speed rail network became such a point of national pride that the developers never stopped to ask if there was a better solution to the problem of moving people around the country. If you run the Ministry of Hammers, every problem starts to look like a nail. Likewise, if you run China Railway, every problem starts to look like it can be solved with a high-speed train. The problem was that that wasn't always necessarily the case. High-speed rail is very technically impressive, and it gets a lot of attention from the international community, attention that the Chinese government really likes. But sometimes there are better alternatives. Regular rail just for a start. Regular rail is much cheaper to build and operate, which means that tickets are also much cheaper. 
This can be very important for cost-conscious workers who are still far from wealthy by Western standards. Regular rail also has the benefit of being able to haul cargo, which for a country as dependent on heavy industry as China, it's a really big deal. For a while, and in isolation, China's high-speed rail network was overdone but breaking even. Losses from unprofitable routes were made up for by highly profitable routes, and the state-owned corporation even got to make a little bit of a profit for itself after paying off its massive debts. This delicate balance stopped in 2015, however. Since then, the interest payments on the accrued debts have been outpacing the operating profits of the rail lines. A number of factors have been making this worse. The lines are starting to age and are requiring more and more maintenance. The rail lines can't increase their prices because then people would just choose to fly or go back to the buses. And then COVID hit, which tanked the demand for all rail tickets to the point where almost every line was unprofitable. So now China is looking at a state-owned enterprise with $850 billion in debt that it can't repay. Ironically, this has come at a time where fiscal stimulus, like the original high-speed rail development program from 2008, would have been needed all over again. Obviously, that's not going to happen here, and the government has already halted construction on any more high-speed rail. But that doesn't mean that they are free from the problems the existing network will create. If you try to sell off the network to pay down these loans, then any profit-motivated company will only be interested in purchasing the highly profitable routes between major cities. This means that the government would need to maintain the unprofitable routes with taxpayer money, which would be a huge ongoing expense. Alternatively, they could just close down the railways. But that would leave hundreds of thousands of workers without a job and destroy one of the greatest symbols of China's economic success over the past two decades. The final option is a bailout and a renationalization of the railway. And yeah, I know China Railway is a state-owned company, but it does have some autonomy that isn't afforded to an actual government ministry. None of these options are particularly appealing, especially during a time when China is facing down the barrel of a housing market crash, an energy crisis, and the impacts of an ongoing pandemic. I am always apprehensive about predicting the future, but it's difficult to see a reality where China just shrugs these issues off. If nothing else, let this latest issue be a demonstration of why massive projects like rail lines, highways, and bridges take time to plan and execute in your home country. You may get angry at red tape, and I do too. But perhaps pointing to China as the place where stuff just gets done isn't the best way to highlight how useless our own governments really are. This video is made possible by Public. In addition to being the most transparent commission-free brokerage, Public makes it really easy to organise a long-term portfolio. I'm not kidding when I say it's as easy as dragging and dropping your favourite companies into the long-term portfolio section. Plus, Public lets you jump right in with your first investment through the magic of fractional share ownership. For example, let's say you want to add an equity position to your portfolio. You found a great company, their financials look good, you're ready to rock. Or maybe you've done the research and you're finally ready to invest in crypto. The only problem is that what you want to invest in has a four digit share price and perhaps you don't want to spend an entire month's rent just to buy one share. That's where fractional share ownership comes in handy. Thanks to Public, you don't need to put up the full amount of cash to buy the required round number of shares. Instead, you can simply choose the dollar amount that you want to invest and with just one click, you can purchase a fraction of a single share, like $5 or $25 worth of a stock or crypto. And guys, the best part is you can get a free stock valued between $3 and $300 when you sign up at public.com slash EE and fund your account. All you need to do is scan the QR code with your camera app, or if you're watching on your phone, just click the link in the video description below. Again, that's public.com slash EE. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.